The alarm clock had set itself as usual for 7.30, but the appliances were awake well before that hour. The vacuum cleaner and the lamp both complained, on rising, of a certain stiffness in their joints. However, as soon as they were on their way, the stiffness seemed to melt away. In the morning light, the forest appeared lovelier than ever. Cobwebs glistening with dew were strung like miniature power lines from bow to bow. Pretty mushrooms spouted from fallen logs, looking for all the world like a string of frosted light bulbs. Leaves rustled. Birds chirped. The radio was certain that it saw a real fox and wanted to go off after it. Just uh, to be sure, you know, that it is a fox. The blanket group quite upset the suggestion. It had already snagged itself once or twice on low-hanging branches. Whatever would become of it, it wanted to know, if it were to venture from the path and into the dense tangle of the forest itself. But think, the radio insisted, a fox will never have such a chance again. I'd like to see it, said the lamp. The toaster, too, was terribly curious, but it could appreciate the blanket's point of view, and so it urged them to continue along the path. Because don't you see, we must reach the master as soon as we possibly can. This was so inarguably true that the radio and lamp readily assented, and they continued on their way. The sun rose in the sky until it had risen all it could, and the path stretched on and on. In the mid-afternoon, there was another shower, after which they once again made camp. Not this time in a meadow, for the woods were now quite dense, and the only open places were those under the larger trees. So instead of sunning itself on the grass, for there was neither grass nor sunlight to be found, the blanket hung itself with the hoover's help from the lowest limb of an immense and ancient oak. In minutes, it had flapped itself dry. At twilight, just as the lamp was thinking of turning itself on, there was a stir among the leaves on the branch to the right of the branch from which the blanket was contentedly hanging. Hello, said a squirrel emerging from the clustered leaves. I thought we had visitors. Hello, Hello replied all the appliances together. Well, 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 the squirrel licked its whiskers. What do you say then, eh? Uh, about what? Asked the toaster, who was not being unfriendly, but who could be a little literal-minded at times, especially when it was tired. The squirrel looked discountenance. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Harold. Having pronounced his name, his good humor seemed completely restored. And this fair creature? Another squirrel dropped from a higher branch and lighted beside Harold. It's my wife, Marjorie. Now you must tell us your names, said Marjorie. Since we've just told you ours. We don't have names, I'm afraid, said the toaster. You see, we're appliances. If you don't have names, Harold demanded, how do you know which of you are men and which are women? Uh, We aren't either. We're appliances. The toaster turned to the Hoover for confirmation. Whatever that may mean, said Marjorie brusquely. It can't alter universal law. Everyone is either a man or a woman. Mice are. Birds are. Even I'm given to understand insects. She held her paw up to her lips and tittered. Do you like to eat insects? No, said the toaster. Not at all. It would have been more trouble than it was worth to explain to the squirrels that appliances didn't eat anything. Neither do I really, said Marjorie. But I love nuts. Do you have any with you, possibly in that old sack? No, said the Hoover stiffly. There is nothing in that old sack, as you call it, but dirt. About five pounds of dirt, I'd estimate. And what is the use, pray, of saving dirt? asked Harold. When no one seemed forthcoming, he said, I know what we'd all enjoy doing. We can tell jokes. You start. I don't think I know any jokes, said the Hoover. Oh, I do, said the radio. You're not Polish, are you? The squirrels shook their heads. Good. (laughs) Tell me, why does it take three poles to screw in a light bulb? Marjorie giggled expectantly. (laughs) I don't know. Why? One, to hold the light bulb, and two, to turn the ladder around. The squirrels looked at each other with bewilderment. Explain it, said Harold. Which are the men and which are the women? It doesn't matter that they're just very stupid. That's the whole idea of Polish jokes, that Poles are supposed to be so stupid that no matter what they try and do, they misfunction. Of course, it's not fair to Poles, who are probably just as bright as anyone else, but they they are funny jokes. I know hundreds more. Well, if that was a fair sample, I can't say I'm very keen to hear the rest, said Marjorie. Harold, you tell him. It. Brio corrected. We're all its. Tell them, Marjorie continued. The one about the three squirrels out in the snow. She turned to the lamp confidingly. This will lay you out, believe me. As Harold told the joke about the three squirrels in the snow, the appliances exchanged glances of guarded disapproval. 
It wasn't just that they disproved of dirty jokes, especially the old Hoover. In addition, they didn't find such jokes amusing. Gender and the complications it gives rise to simply aren't relevant to the lives appliances led. Harold finishes jokes, and Marjorie laughed loyally, but none of the appliances cracked a smile. Well, Harold miffed, I hope you enjoy your new stay under our oak. With which, and a flick of their big furry tails, the two squirrels scampered up the trunk and out of sight. In the small hours of the night, the toaster woke from a terrible nightmare in which it had been about to fall into a bathtub full of water to discover itself in a plight almost as terrible. Thunder was thundering, and lightning was streaking the sky, and rain was pelting mercilessly. At first, the toaster couldn't remember where it was or why it was there, and when it did remember, it realized with dismay the electric blanket, which ought to have been spread out and sheltering the other four appliances, had disappeared. And the rest of them? They were still here, thank heaven, though in a state of fearful apprehension, each of them. Oh dear, groaned the Hoover. I should have known, I should have known. We never, never should have left our home. The lamp, in an extremity of speechless agitation, was twisting its head rapidly from side to side, casting its little beam of light across the gnarled roots of the oak, while the radio's alarm had gone off and would not stop ringing. Finally, the toaster went over the radio and turned the alarm off itself. Oh, thank you, said the radio, its voice blurred with static. Thank you so much. Where's the blanket? The toaster demanded, apprehensively. Blown away, said the radio. Blown off to the far end of the forest where we shall never be able to find it. Oh, I should have known, groaned the Hoover. I should have known. It's not your fault, the toaster assured the vacuum, but it only groaned the louder. Seeing as it could not be of any help to the vacuum, the toaster went over to the lamp and tried to calm it down. Once its beam was steady, the toaster suggested that it be directed to the branches above them, on the chance that the blanket, when it was blown away, might have been snagged on one of them. The lamp did so, but it was a very faint light, and a very tall oak, and a very dark night, and the blanket, if it were up there, was not to be seen. All of a sudden, there was a flash of lightning. The radio's alarm went off again, and the lamp shrieked and folded itself up as small as it could be. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Of course, it's silly to be afraid of lightning, since it's only another form of electricity. But such a large form, and so uncontrolled. If you're a person, instead of an appliance, and you encountered a berserk giant many times larger than yourselves, you'd have some idea how the average electric appliance feels about lightning. In the brief moment that the lightning was lighting everything up, the toaster, who had been peering up into the oak, was able to make out a shape, all twisted about, that might have been the blanket. The toaster waited until there was another lightning flash, and yes, definitely it was the yellow blanket, which had indeed become snagged on one of the highest branches of the tree. Once they all knew the blanket was nearby, even though they had no idea how they'd be able to get down, the storm ceased to be quite so scary. The rain made them quite miserable, as rain will do, but their worst anxieties were over. Even the occasional bolt of lightning was now something to be wished for rather than dreaded, since by its brightness they could glimpse their companion high above them, clutching the limb of the oak and flailing in the ceaseless winds. How could they feel afraid or even sorry for themselves when they considered the terrors that poor blanket must be experiencing? By morning, the storm had abated. The radio, at top volume, called up to the blanket, but the blanket made no response. For one horrible moment, the toaster thought its friend might have stopped working altogether. But the radio kept on calling to the blanket, and after a time, it made a feeble reply, waving one wet bedraggled corner at its friends. You can come down now, the radio shouted. The storm is over. I can't, said the blanket with a whimper. I'm stuck. I can't get down. You must try, the toaster urged. What's that? said the blanket. The toaster said you must try. But I told you, I'm stuck, and there's a great rip right through the center of me, and another by my hem, and I hurt. The blanket began to wring itself convulsively, and a steady patter of droplets fell from its rain-soaked wool into the puddles below. What the deuce is all this racket about? Harold demanded imperiously, stepping forth from his nest in the high trunk of the oak. Give an idea what time it is. Squirrels are trying to sleep. The radio apologized to Harold and then explained the cause of the commotion. Like most squirrels, Harold was essentially kind-hearted, and when he saw what had happened to the blanket, he immediately offered his assistance. First, he went into his nest and woke his wife. Then, together, the two squirrels began to help the blanket to loosen itself from where it had been snared. It was a long and, to judge by the blanket's cries, painful process. But at last it was done, and with the squirrel's help, the liberated blanket made its way slowly and carefully down the trunk of the tree. The appliances gathered around their friend. 
commiserating over its many injuries and rejoicing its rescue. How shall we ever be able to repay you? said the toaster warmly, turning to Harold and Marjorie. You've saved our friend from a fate too terrible to imagine. We're so grateful. Well, <laughs> said Marjorie cagely. I can't remember whether or not you said you had any nuts with you. But if you do... Believe me, said the Hoover, if we did, you would have them all. But you can see for yourselves that my bag contains nothing but dust and dirt. Whereupon it opened its dust bag and a thick brown sludge of rain-sodden topsoil oozed forth. Though we don't have any nuts, said the toaster to the disconsolate squirrels. Perhaps there is something I could do for you. That is, if you like roasted nuts. Indeed, yes, said Harold. Any kind will do. Then if you can provide me with some nuts, I shall roast them. As many as you like. Harold narrowed his eyes suspiciously. You mean, you want us to give you the nuts that we've been storing up all this summer? If you'd like me to roast them, answered the toaster brightly. Oh, darling, do, Marjorie urged. I don't know what he means to do, but he seems to, and we might like it. I think it's a trick, said Harold. Just two or three of the ones that are left from last year, please. No, oh, very well. Harold scampered up the tree trunk to his nest and returned with four acorns stuffed in the pouches of his cheeks. At the toaster's bidding, Harold and Marjorie cracked them open, and then Harold placed them carefully on the thin strips of metal that went up and down inside the toaster's slots. As these strips were meant to accommodate large slices of bread, it had to be very careful, lest the tiny round acorns should roll off as it lowered them into itself. When this was done, it turned on its coils and commenced toasting them. When the acorns were starting to turn a crispy brown, the toaster lifted them up gently as far as it could, turned off its coils, and... When it judged the squirrels would not burn their paws by reaching in, bade them to take out the roasted nuts and taste them. Delicious, Marjorie declared. Exquisite, Harold agreed. As soon as the squirrels had eaten the first four acorns, they returned to their nest for more, and when those were gone, still more, and then again some more after that. Marjorie especially was insatiable. She urged his hoster to remain in the forest as their guest. It could stay in their own nest, where it would always be dry and cozy, and she would introduce it to all their friends. I'd love to be able to accept, said the toaster, from a sense not only of politeness, but of deep obligation as well. But it really isn't possible. Once I have roasted your nuts for you, would you like some more? We must be on our way to the city where our master lives. When the toaster roasted some more acorns, the radio explained to the squirrels the important reason for their journey. It also demonstrated its own capacities as a utensil and persuaded the other appliances to do the same. The poor Hoover was scarcely able to function from having been clogged with mud, and the squirrels, in any case, could not see the point of sweeping up dirt from one place and putting it somewhere else. Nor did the lamp's beams or the radio's music excite their admiration. However, they were both very taken with the electric blanket, which, damp as it was, had plugged itself into the battery strapped under the office chair and was glowing warmly. Marjorie renewed her invitation to the toaster and extended to the blanket as well. Until... She explained... You're quite well again. That's very kind, said the blanket. And of course, I'm so grateful for all you've done. But we must be on our way, truly. Marjorie sighed, resignedly. At least, she said, keep your tail tucked into that black thing that makes the furry part of you so delightfully hot until you have to leave. The warmth is so pleasant, isn't it, my dear? Oh, yes, said Harold, who's busy shelling acorns and most agreeable. The Hoover ventured a mild protest for it feared that with both the toaster and the blanket working so hard, the battery would be worn down needlessly. But really, what else could they do but comply with the squirrel's request? Besides, quite apart from their debt of gratitude, it felt so good to be useful again. The toaster would have gone on gladly roasting acorns all morning and all afternoon, and the squirrel seemed much of the same disposition. It's strange, said Harold complacently while he stroked the toaster's side, now sadly streaked with raindrop patterns like the outside of a window. It's more than strange you should maintain that you have no sex, when it's clear to me that you're male. He studied his own face in the modded cronium. You have a man's whiskers and a man's front teeth. Nonsense, darling, said his wife, who was laying on the other side of the toaster. Now that I look carefully, I can see her whiskers are most definitely a woman's whiskers, and teeth as well. I won't argue my love about anything so patently obvious as whether or not a man is a man, for it's evident that he is. It suddenly dawned on the toaster how the squirrels and the daisy the day before had come by their confusions. They were seeing themselves in its sides. Living in the wilds they did, where there are no bathroom mirrors, 
they were unacquainted with the principle of reflectivity. He considered trying to explain their error to them, but what would be the use? They would only go away with hurt feelings. You can't always expect people, or squirrels, to be rational. Appliances, yes, appliances have to be rational because they're built that way. To Harold, the toaster explained, under a seal of strictest sec secrecy, that it was indeed, just as he suspected, a man. And to Marjorie, it confided, under a similar pact of trust, that it was a woman. It hoped they were both true to their promises. If not, their argument would be fated to continue for a long, long while. With the coils turned to hot, the blanket was soon quite dry, and so, after a final round of roast acorns, the appliances said goodbye to Harold and Marjorie and continued on their way.